Bobbich. Uh, Julia starts self, uh, likes tea, she told me. And she also likes JavaScript. Well, I'm not sure you didn't tell me if you like JavaScript, but at least you're on the, on the committee designing it. Right? Yes, I am on the committee designing okay. JavaScript. So, a uh, warm round of applause for Julia. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to try to project my voice. Uh, if you can't hear me in the back, please let me know, and I'll try to be louder. Uh, I hope. Oh, it went to sleep. Come back. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I hope you all had a cup of coffee or something with caffeine. We're at 4 p.m. and we're going to talk about. Okay, we're going to talk about math, and there's 205 slides to get through. So first of all, we're going to talk about math to start, and we're going to talk about math with Roman numerals. How do people feel about that? Feel, feeling Woo! good? Great. <laughs> well, okay. So what does it say? <laughs> Twenty-one times. 17. Excellent. 21 times 17. How do you do multiplication with Roman numerals? Who in the room knows how to do multiplication with Roman numerals? I'm seeing a lot of like. Cry. Cry. Let's let's get through our tears. And the way that you do it is you create two columns. One column is on this side, and then the other column is on that side. So left and right. I can't tell the difference between left and right. I will get them mixed up through the course of this talk. But just uh, wherever the text appears on the screen is the one that I'm talking about. So the first thing that you do is you take the left <laughs> column and you divide it by two. When you divide it by two, it's actually super easy. You can see there's two x's, which represents 10. And what you have is one x, which is 10. So 20, uh, two x's is 20, and then one x is 10, with a remainder of one. Then we uh, drop the remainder of one, and we divide that again by two. Uh, we get five, no remainder, we just divide it directly by two. Then we have two remainder one, we drop the remainder, we have one. Uh, we take the x from the first operation that we did and we write it down. We take the v, the five, uh, from the second operation that we did and we write it down. We take the two from the third operation that we did and we write it down. And then we take the one and leave it as is, write it down. And then what do you do on the right hand side? Well, you kind of do the opposite. You multiply it by two. So we started with 17, we now have 34. Fantastic, how fast did, it, how many people actually read the 34? Excellent. Uh, and then we do that again and we multiply it by two. Uh, we have 68 and so on. Okay, cool. Then we have these two columns of numbers that we're going to work with. The next thing that we do is we take from, in the cases where both columns have even numbers, we cross those out. Those aren't part of what we're interested in. And just drop them. And then you take just the right-hand column and uh, you add them up. And how do you add them up? Well, you do it all visually. Uh, you take the two hundreds, those are hundreds, and the two, uh, the, the fifties, the L's, and there's two of them. You take the tens and you just write them down. And then you take the ones and you write them down. Fantastic. And that's our number, which we simplify into 357, what I think. What happened to the V's? Sorry? What happened to the V's? Uh, there, were no, uh, there weren't any V's when we were, oh, I missed a V. No, <laughs> you, get the, you get the general idea. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. <laughs> Next time I do this talk, this will be fixed. Uh, so, um, multiplication with Roman numerals. No problem, now we know why the Romans were so well known for their mathematics. <laughs> right? Okay, uh, why don't we do that again? Let's try it this time with Arabic numerals, which came into common use in approximately the 14th century, 14th, 15th century. Now, again, we can use the visuals of the notation uh, to do the calculation. So here, you take the, uh, uh, from the bottom row, uh, you take the seven, the, the, the right-hand side most uh, character, and you treat it in isolation, and you multiply it against the first uh, number that we see above, which is one, then you multiply it against the tens, and as we do that, for the first calculation that we need to do, we get seven. For the second calculation, well, we can break it down again. We're again breaking it down to the single digits. We have uh, seven times two, which is 14, times 10, which gives us 120. Put that all together, you get 147. Then you switch over to the, um, to the next character on the, uh, sorry, directions, to the tens. You, you know what I'm talking about. You all did this in school. Uh, you do the same thing, you visually walk through the notation, you get a 210, and then you put that also in the column underneath uh, 147. 
Then, what do we do? Addition, yeah, totally. How do we do it? You go by column. So visually, we're again using what, uh, what the notation is showing us and we're adding using that notation and we get 357. Cool, right? What am I talking about here? Well, I'm talking about representation. And, okay, sure, we've got two representations of numbers. What does it mean? Well, representations give us different views on the same piece of information. Like, for example, here we've got a photo of a Siberian cat and here we have a cat that I drew. Uh, now, the photo tells you that it's a Siberian cat and this gives you the idea of a cat. They might have different purposes, right? I want to give you a little anecdote from Borges, and uh, there's this phrase, you might have heard it in science, the map is not the territory. This refers to, well, it's kind of coming from this story from Borges, where he says, uh, the story goes along the lines of, there was this uh, civilization whose highest form of intellectual activity was to do cartography, and to draw the most detailed maps possible. And eventually, they started making maps that were as big as the country that they were mapping. But these maps were completely useless. Like they, they had no purpose because they were too hard to actually read. You might as well just walk to the next village rather than figure out where it was. And this was talking about the limitations of representation and the purposes of representation. Now, um, when we were talking about this, this is a representation of numbers. And this is showing two different ways of understanding numbers. The two of them can show different aspects of numbers, just like a map, it shows a top-down view of a spatial area. And these two are showing two different aspects of numbers. But they're doing more than this. They are actually showing us how to do the mathematics. They're aiding us in how we think through the problem that we're uh, trying to understand. This means that the batteries are included with the representation. Isn't that neat? I think that's really cool. But we're not talking about, <laughs> we're not talking about Roman numerals. We're actually talking about programming here. And how do we find the right representation for a given programming abstraction? So, uh, this is where I get to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Yulia. I am Mozilla's TC39 representative, which means I go to the committee and I represent specific concerns coming from the spider monkey engine and say like, oh, we don't wanna do that, we wanna do this. And also I try to represent something of how um, decisions about modifying JavaScript impacts programmers. So we're going to talk about language experimentation, and we're going to talk a bit about JavaScript. I actually pulled back quite a bit of the JavaScript content because it can be a little bit daunting to understand all of the context, so it'll be simplified. We're going to talk about what you can do with all of this stuff. So what? <laughs> what are we going to talk about here? Um, we have a new feature that's coming into JavaScript that has to do with the order of things. For example, Let's say that you're at home and you need to do the laundry, and there's a series of steps to doing the laundry. You need to gather the clothes, you need to wash the clothes, you need to dry the clothes, and then you need to fold the clothes. Now, we have a single variable that we're, uh, a single thing, thing that we're operating on, which is clothes. And it's nice, you know, the way that it's listed here, it's very human readable. Uh, we read naturally from top to bottom. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense when we read it in this form. Now, in JavaScript, you might have something like this. <laughs> Uh, depending on how you're represented, but the, we're using this example in this case. And this is a little harder to read, uh, in particular because we have to read backwards. We have to start from uh, the innermost scope and then go out as we read it in order to understand the order of things that happen. Uh, it's not exactly intuitive for programmers, uh, or for anybody really. So let's take some inspiration from another field. Let's take some inspiration from Unix, for example, the pipe. That's a really intuitive way, and when this was introduced, uh, I forget the guy's name, but he was like, this, this was sort of revolutionary because it really simplified uh, our way of taking inputs, uh, taking outputs from one program and piping them into inputs of another program. So uh, this is a, if you're not familiar with pipes, this is a pipe. And uh, this is a pipe, this is the JavaScript pipe. And for legacy reasons, we had to use these characters instead of the other ones. I won't get into that, but so. What we can do is we can take this and we can represent it instead like this. This is the proposal. It's called the pipeline operator in JavaScript if you want to check it out. Uh, it's been under discussion for a very long time because we're stuck. <sighs> what could be complicated about this, right? Like, It looks relatively straightforward, it looks relatively simple, but you see, uh, oh, I think I 
Ah, right, sorry, I forgot which order I had my slides in. Um, so we wanted to ask the question, is this better than what we have? So we have this, is this really better than what we have? Is it worth introducing this new concept into the language? when we can already like have intermediary variables and you can just pass things into those intermediary variables and act on those, like is it really necessary? And um, the other question we had is which one is better? Now I'm saying which one is better because there are two competing pipeline proposals. Why? Well, imagine we've actually got a second argument uh, to this function. JavaScript does not have a concept of currying or partial application. It has no way of doing that. And this is a pretty common pattern where you need to have two arguments, but you need to find a way to do that. So we take our pipeline operator and now we're gonna make it really, really terrible. Specifically, we're gonna say, oh, if only we had partial application, we could make it nice and pretty like this. And this would be a construct that exists throughout JavaScript, right? Like it would be nice to have partial application as a thing in JavaScript, but as a committee, for reasons that we won't get into right now, uh, we decided that we don't want to have partial application. So it was proposed that we would add this special character that doesn't exist anywhere else in JavaScript that would only be usable in this situation to the language. This is option one that we have, and this would be like a sort of limited scope partial application. Eh, eh, you know, getting a little nervous, right? The alternative is that we could have anonymous functions that we like write in place that take the input that's being put from the last function and then passes it into the function that we actually want to call. Now this is an uglier version because I don't know how much uh, experience everybody has with JavaScript. You can actually write it like this, which is a little bit better, but it's still kind of bad. And the question that the committee has been trying to answer for over a year is which one of these two options should we do? Yeah, so that. How are we going to answer this question? Well, there's a couple of things we know about programmers. There's a couple of things that we can find out from observing programmers. One of them is how fast they do things. And the other thing that we can find out about them is how quickly they do them. So for example, Oh, how many people know the answer to this question? Uh, variable A is equal to the type of an empty array. What is A? Object. Excellent. It is indeed object, because it's JavaScript, and everything is an object. And uh, what, what we can do with this is, uh, I could have been up here, I didn't have a stopwatch, I have a stopwatch timing the talk, but I could be up here and timing how long it took you to answer that. And then we could test that against a similar thing uh, to see how long that question took you. And we could compare and say, hmm, people got the right answer faster with this version than with that version. Or maybe we could say, people got the wrong answer very quickly with this version, which means maybe there's something wrong with the API. Maybe something's not intuitive there. They think that it should be doing something else. There's lots of interesting things that just from time and from uh, correctness that you can infer from uh, an API. This is just one way to do this. There are other ways to do this. You can come up with other, uh, there are other patterns, but it's also a very common one. You'll see this happening also in other HCI, uh, human computer interaction studies. Uh, for example, I was speaking to someone the other day about uh, testing whether or not short feedback loops improve programmer productivity and programmer correctness. And uh, they used a very similar technique to this one. So we can push this, we can push these basic questions into sort of hypotheses, like uh, is this better than what we have? Well, we can say we will see a difference in speed and correctness be between the uh, old version, the existing JavaScript version, and this new version that we're trying to introduce. And then for which version, that question is very similar. We're basically checking the speed and correctness of these two different versions and seeing what happens. This is something called quantitative methods. We're going to get numbers out of this uh, and we're going to be operating on a population of programmers to understand how they program and uh, how they react to certain stimuli. And it comes back to sort of the, the, the history of medical research. Uh, you take a population of, of people and you test two things, uh, splitting the population equally. Now, there is a set of guidelines if you want to do this more rigorously, or for example, if you want to write a paper about it. 
or alternatively, if you're reviewing a paper or you just want to hold yourself to that standard, there is a standard called consort and it comes with a checklist and a, um, and a flowchart that you can follow to be like, did I do everything right? Did I do everything according to the recommendation? Now, I've distilled it down to four bullet points. It's longer than this. This is a simplification. Uh, but here are sort of like some things that you can take away from that checklist. Is it a randomized trial? Did we randomize it? Um, what does randomization mean? Uh, that means like uh, you take a group of people and like you randomize which inputs they get and you randomize uh, like which groups are allocated how. You don't try to favor one over the other, things like this. How are the subjects allocated? As I mentioned, like uh, are you allocating them all equally across buckets uh, of what they're testing, etc. Uh, how did the trial change and why? I'll get into that in a second. And for each group, what is necessary to replicate? So your trial should be replicable uh, so that your conclusions can be verified. Because maybe uh, you run a trial uh, on one population and uh, maybe you rerun the trial on that population and you get the same outcome. And then someone wants to apply that to a different population and you can get different results. Another thing that can happen is maybe your trial sample was too small and you need to take a bigger sample, etc. cetera. Uh, it should always be replicable. So in our case, uh, in the experiment I described, it was equally distributed. We had two branches. Uh, we were testing two things. And uh, they were equally split into these two branches. And the branches had uh, randomly assigned questions, which I'll get into in a second, because we have another problem when it comes to testing syntax. Uh, did the trial change? Yes, it did. Um, so I found in the course of the trial that there was one outlier point that just completely skewed the data, like completely, and that was introducing a weight syntax. If you, ha if you were testing against a weight syntax, um, programmers were much more likely to get it wrong. So I ended up having to take it out. So that's, that's one example, like, did the trial change? You should declare that the trial changed in a specific way. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going really fast. Maybe we'll do the questions at the end, just remember them, and because it, it is, uh, we are almost halfway through the talk. No, oh, what time is it? I'm going really fast, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so extra tips. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's a nice way to do it, to publish your hypothesis before your trial, because when you publish your hypothesis before you do the trial, you're not tempted to change your hypothesis in order to fit your results. And that helps, uh, like, there is always a temptation because in the case of the trial I showed you, it took me three months to get through the data and I really wanted to show something and I came out quite disappointed and it was really tempting to just be like, oh no, 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 we were testing something else. But no, stick to your original hypothesis because a failure is also important. Um, you and your participants are human. We're dealing with human test subjects and sometimes there's a tendency to be like, oh, well, they're just test subjects and you start, they become dehumanized. But by maintaining sort of a human relationship, with your test subjects, uh, you um, can practice a certain amount of empathy that'll give you a chance to see things that you might not have seen otherwise. It gives you a chance to listen, and we'll talk about that later. Don't test too much. I made this mistake with my first experiment. It had seven branches. Do not do that. It really makes your life hell. Okay, and before the survey, grab your colleagues, hopefully of different levels, and run the tests on them ahead of time. Um, I uh, ran a prep experiment where I had the same experiment with two different types of syntax, two different types of story for the syntax. So the first one had work style syntax, where it was stuff that you would find at your job, string manipulation, and the second one had kimchi syntax. I'll show you what that means. So here is the work syntax. Uh, it says uh, we have string manipulation here, like double say and capitalize and stuff like that and then uh, just um, concatenating all of that. So this was one way that people saw it. So it was very close to work related. Second one was I was uh, having instructions related to making pickles, specifically to making kimchi. And the interesting thing about running these two versions of the trial on my programmer colleagues who had been programming for 10 to 15 years, so we're talking like really professional programmers who do this every day for a long time, the better choice was kimchi. The reason for this that I got from my colleagues was that using a physical process helped keep the, keep the focus on the syntax. By doing these trials before, 
you actually run the experiment, you'll be able to find out whether or not your experiment is doing what you want. Because you might be testing something that you don't think that you're testing. You might be testing something completely different. Which is, for example, how hard is it for people to do mental operation on strings? Which isn't what we want to test. Okay, so the other issue with this particular experiment is that we have to deal with learning. The style of experiment that I ran uh, was error identification. One part of the experiment was error identification and seeing whether or not a programmer could easily identify an error in the syntax. Um, in this case, the error is a new jar, which is a valid JavaScript syntax, so a linter would not catch this. And um, it's missing the parentheses and a, an argument that needs to be passed to jar. And that's hinted to by the, by the error message. But if we test it against the other syntax and it's the exact same error, a person who sees both of these versions uh, will do the second one much faster because they've already seen they've already seen where the problem is. They'll catch it much faster, which means we would have to do adjustments um, to how we weight these two, because the first uh, the first problem would be a more fair test than the second problem. Now, one way you can deal with this is when you have your subjects, you can randomize the samples that you're using. But there's another way that you can do this, which is creating a series of close equivalent questions. And that's what I did. So we have close equivalents uh, that, uh, in one case, there's a slightly different error of the same class. It's also a syntax error. And in the other one, we have the syntax error that we saw before. And it, using that, randomized uh, with participants, you're able to test, in a more useful way, the same type of behavior. Uh, right, so this is, uh, these are the missing errors. So, the experiment. What were the results? What did we come up with? This must have like, given us a clear answer about what we should do with the syntax, right? First question. Is this better? Or is this better? Well, we had fantastic results. Obviously, the second one was better. Excellent. This is a clear thing that I'm not showing the numbers because this hasn't been published yet, but it clearly it's, <laughs> it's a very good result. We have a clear yes uh, with an asterisk because you saw the syntax is actually quite an exaggeration of JavaScript, but this is, this is a nice result to see. Now, which version? Our second question. Well, we've got these two versions. Which one won? Yeah. I, 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 I think I would also have the same situation. People performed on these two versions of the, of the test uh, pretty much equally. Like, they weren't faster, they weren't more correct, uh, they weren't faster to get to errors, uh, and it didn't matter, like, pretty much all of the variations. So, like, we had several variants of the errors that they were looking for, and they were all pretty much identical. Um, so, well, let's ask them another question. What did they like better? Maybe this is a way that we can determine which syntax we should go with. Uh, oh, oh no. Oh, that's where that slide went. Okay, I lost that slide and now I know where it is. <laughs> okay, um, and we had these overwhelming results. Version one, everybody loved it with the hash that you saw before. And version two, a couple of people were like, no, no, I really, really prefer version two. Is, is this enough? What do you think? Is it enough to just ask people what they like better? to go ahead and be like, we're going to implement that now. Like yes? My question is, is it worth to add an extra syntax like the hash and mm -hmm. make the language more complex for beginners, for parsers, for everybody, just because it's one millisecond faster than the mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Because that's why it's called syntactic sugar. If you ask a kid, it's good. they want yeah, sweets, sure. and they will say, yes, they want, but it doesn't mean it's good for them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not necessarily that programmers uh, uh, you get the slide. <laughs> you, get the slide. Um, you get a cookie. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's not that they necessarily don't know what's good for them, but the decision making that you make on a case by case basis, like let's say mm, it's 2 p.m., it's too early for dinner, I'm hungry, I'm going to have a snack. The decision you make there is going to be different than if you're planning from the beginning of the day and saying that I'm going to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and this is the nutrients. Yes? I do not subscribe to this assumption that you necessarily know it better than your users. So it works just to two different positions. So these two points, I think you have to argue why you are in a position to to decide for your users. Oh, but please continue. Yeah. What's, but what's the definition of user? A beginner that's learning JavaScript? Uh, a professional excellent. 10 years? The implementation of a new browser? That's an excellent question. Who are our populations? And do we really know better? 
but at the same time, what, uh, what the real thing is, is this question that we asked, which version? Maybe it's the wrong question. Maybe we shouldn't be asking which version because we didn't really give them a lot of flexibility in what they were choosing. We just said, which version do you like better? That's, uh, that narrows the range of responses that they could potentially have. Maybe there's something more there. So let's uh, take a short digression. Let's go back to Roman numerals. Why do we have Roman numerals? Where did they come from, right? Well, here's the phantom slide. Um, well, uh, Roman numerals are something called sign value notation. And you might be familiar with this. You see it in prisons, uh, where uh, it's, <laughs> it's related to counting. Uh, and you can see, uh, first of all, it visually groups the number five, and also you can see the logic of how the numbers are represented right away. It's called sign value notation. And naturally, like um, today, we use positional notation, which is different, where the position, the index of the number, is related to uh, uh, its value uh, in relation to decimals. So you have the index and the decimals increase in that direction. But of course, positional notation must be newer than sign value notation. So how old are Roman numerals? Pretty ancient, right? They're pretty old. <laughs> like, that must be why we know Roman numerals. They were one of the early number systems. They're from 100 BCE. They, were, they finally stopped fluctuating at 100 BCE. So the ones that we know today are from that age. How old is positional notation? Any guesses? 700? 700? So, sorry? 700 years ago. 700 years ago? That's one guess. Any others? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 2000 BCE. They are way older than uh, Roman numerals. It's called Babylonian positional notation. That's the first recorded positional notation that we have. And it looks like this. It does not have a concept of zero, and it's base 60. I know what you're thinking. It's way too old. Of course, we forgot about it. No zero, like how are you gonna do anything with that? Base 60, who uses that? We use it for like all of our circles. <laughs> Mathematics on circles actually comes from the Babylonians. Um, but let's take something more contemporary. Greek numerals were also positional notation. They were 140 BCE. So around the same time contemporary and like a nearby kingdom to uh, the Romans. And they had a concept of zero. Isn't that awesome? It wasn't used as a decimal figure though. So you wouldn't have something like uh, the four, which is delta, and the zero, uh, you would have, there's a special character for showing that it's in the tens. So they, uh, and as you know, like the Greeks were pretty well known for their mathematics, the Romans not so much. Basically easier math, right? And they had it contemporaneously. So why uh, are we so much more familiar with Roman numerals? Why is it something that's much more in our culture today than Babylonian numerals or Greek numerals, or any of the other positional, uh, any of the other positional notation systems. For example, the Hebrews also had it, the Chinese had it, etc. Romans are kind of even standing out a little bit, having uh, using a sign value notation for mathematics so late. Why do we end up with inefficient representations? Why are we speaking in English, for example? Uh, why aren't we using a different language? Well, one of those things might be inertia, right? Like you need to have a certain amount of critical mass of people speaking a specific language or using a specific notation system in order to move it forward. For example, Esperanto is not exactly in common use, but it was designed to be easy to learn and easy to use. But representations are also political. Um, they have something to do with power. So one of my favorite one is about bees. Uh, now, uh, again, going back to classical history, Aristotle, which is this guy left, said that bees had a king because at that time it was understood that um, uh, everything powerful must be male. Uh, and the beekeepers contemporaneously knew that that wasn't true, but they didn't have the clout to actually get that written down as science. So it was known for a long time that uh, bees did not have a king, but in terms of text, in terms of history being recorded, for a very long time, bees had a king. They just laid eggs. And this comes down to bias. Um, this syntax is better for me. Like, if you're coming, if you've been trained your entire life uh, from a C syntax perspective, you're going to see certain syntaxes much more natural. Whereas someone who hasn't ever programmed before is going to be like, 
No, that makes absolutely no sense to me. Uh, if you've ever had the uh, chance to teach a complete beginner programming, it's really incredible the questions that they ask. Like, why do you need to put function before the parentheses? What do these parentheses mean? Why are these parentheses different than those parentheses? None of this comes naturally. This is all stuff that we've learned and it feels natural to us, but it isn't natural to beginners. That doesn't mean that the beginners are wrong. They might actually be able to tell us that bees are actually queens, that they aren't kings. And another type of bias is that only quantitative data matters, the kind of data that you can get numbers out of. So, oh, we can measure how fast programmers uh, do a problem and we can measure how correctly they do it. This is more important than, for example, going and asking them something. But a huge revolution happened in psychology when psychologists, starting with Freud, started listening to their patients. Like things really moved forward by listening to people. There's this really great, just to give one last example, there's this really great paper, The Effect of Poor Source Code Lexicon and Readability on Developers' Cognitive Load. Uh, and I really like this paper because they actually tested, and this is gonna be a really long quote, I'm terribly sorry. They actually tested using FNIRS, which basically tests the amount of oxygenation in your brain uh, to determine whether or not you're frustrated with something, followed with eye tracking devices to follow where your eyes are moving through the page. And they found that it had a similarity of 78% to what uh, programmers reported themselves to having difficulty. I love that. And I was, when I first read this paper, I was like, oh, how the heck am I gonna get this machine and like test blood oxygenation of the brain and do eye tracking? And then I read this, uh, this uh, statement again, and I was like, similarity of 78%. Self-reported. You can trust people. You can just ask people and they're gonna tell you <laughs> what they find frustrating and you can trust that. Fantastic, let's just ask them questions. So we should use the right tool in order to determine what we need to test. Because, you know, it's really exciting to jump directly into quantitative methods, but maybe when we're jumping into those quantitative methods, we don't yet know what we're testing. Maybe we need to find out the, the qualities that we need to understand before we get into that. So there's another really interesting paper that I read uh, before doing the survey, which is how not to survey programs. So the paper name is a little bit longer, but if you want to look it up, uh, the name is there. Uh, and this paper was really interesting in that uh, they had some suggestions from their experiences of surveying programmers in order to understand how things worked. Uh, specifically, they said, add an extra question at the end that's completely open and just let them tell you stuff. Let them, let them talk to you. And I did that. And there was this extra question and they could just write whatever they wanted. You know what they told us in that little section? They told us why. They told us why they wanted the feature, why they struggled with the feature, why they thought it was important, why they thought it was bad. And this was an incredible wealth of information. This brings us to qualitative methods. Now, what do you do with all of this information? Like, is there any system for understanding uh, what this information means or categorizing it or anything? There are, and I'm gonna introduce you to two of them. The first one is called grounded theory. Grounded theory, uh, you develop a theory about a body of knowledge and try that uh, closely models it. it. It doesn't have to model everything, but it should give you an idea of what's going on. So uh, to summarize, this is again, this is not the full grounded theory. This is a summary of it. Uh, it's definitely worth reading about. Uh, you have a series of steps. First, you go through your text body or your uh, database and you code everything. And coding means like just coming up with ways to describe in one word what that, thing, what that thing is that they're saying. Then you categorize it, so you uh, consolidate, you find relationships between categories, you try to understand who, and you build a theory. So let's see what that looks like step by step. So you, you have this big block of comments. It was huge, I had a thousand of them, which I thought I would be able to do. I ended up cutting it down to a hundred. Uh, and I would get stuff like this. I find the first version easier to read, but harder to understand. Great. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't like tell you, tell you which way to go, it just gives you information, it just gives you qualitative information about the feature. So easier to read, that's interesting. That's about readability, great. So we take our, uh, our database of comments and we add a column taking it, in my case, I took it fragment by fragment. You can do it differently. There are other ways to do this. So we take that fragment and we give it its code, its readability. 
then this, this particular statement had more than one code in it, so the second code in it was harder to understand. Well, I categorize that as heavy cognitive load and as a negative thing. Add another column, uh, add the fragment, add the code, etc. Cool. Now we have a list of a lot of codes and like some, you know, uh, it's not something you can do in one day, so I found myself going like day after day and uh, trying different things and I would use different vocabulary to, uh, to ident identify different things, even though they were kind of the same. So sometimes I would say learnability rather than teachability, but those were kind of the same. So the next step is to f identify the appropriate level of abstraction. Uh, this is called in grounded theory axial coding or categorization. So exactly what I just described, easy to learn, easy to teach, well they're talking about pedagogy. Uh, typing difficult keyboard version, that's about ergonomics, uh, which is interesting because the pipeline operator had a lot to do with um, uh, ergonomics. And then there are other ones as well. So selective coding is the next step after categorization where you try to understand because different categories tend to relate to different types, uh, to different parts of the process. For example, some codes are related to circumstances. For example, I am learning. I am a learner. That is my circumstance. Some are actions. I am teaching. Uh, I am an experienced programmer who is teaching other people to learn. And then others are consequences. And I find this to, have, to encourage code smell. Uh, so this is a way that you could build a story about uh, what the person is saying. Finally, you do comparative analysis, which uh, you brought up earlier about who is uh, doing things. So for example, if the person is a native English speaker, they may have a different approach to a beginner who may have a different approach to a uh, experienced programmer. And the, the categories that they might be talking about might be different. So uh, what, one thing that's interesting is that sometimes beginners and experts agree more than, uh, than people who are intermediate. And we build stories for each of those. Finally, we're building the theory. And the theory, is, uh, theory building is describing uh, as well as we can the constraints that exist in the system. Now, maybe we can st skip a step, and I'm gonna go a little bit faster here. So I'm sorry if I was talking fast already, it's gonna go even faster now. <laughs> <laughs> Grounded theory uh, has all this stuff going on, but what if we could sort of uh, use somebody else's research to get rid of two of those steps? That's where cognitive dimensions of notation comes in. Now, cognitive no uh, dimensions of notation is a pretty big set of things. I'm not gonna list them all, but here are a couple error proneness of the code, which is what I was looking at. Consistency, closeness of mapping. What do these all mean? Closeness of mapping, actually Roman numerals are really good at closeness of mapping because they're assigned value uh, notation. They basically tell you how to read themselves. Exactly. Hard mental operations. Uh, Roman numerals aren't so good at that, but the decimal, the positional notation system that we use today is better for hard mental operations because you have more on the page that you can use directly. Otherwise, you, you need to use uh, you need to either write stuff down or you need to memorize stuff. Uh, diffuseness, ter terseness. I don't have to type so much. That's one side of diffuseness, terseness. Uh, this looks like Perl. That's another side of diffuseness, <laughs> terseness, um, etc. And you can also give positive, negative values for each one of these. What did TC39 learn from doing this exercise and going through all of these different iterations over um, the pipeline operator? Well, it revealed that the solution we discarded needed to be revisited. What solution? Partial application. I mentioned it earl earlier, right? We don't have partial application in the language because um, it was argued that partial application would lead to problems for coders. Now, uh, and if we went and we surveyed coders and, being, and asked how important is partial application in the language for you, you're not gonna get a lot of people, uh, that's what's amazing about JavaScript programmers. A lot of them are self-taught. They don't have a computer science background. They might not know what partial application means. So you ask them how important is partial application, you might get a weird answer. You might get a lot of people being like, oh, I don't think that's very important. Give me this other thing instead. But when you read the comments that they say, they say, for example, this weird hash, they're like, that's really great. It would be great to have that expanded to, to the entire language. And they start talking about partial application without knowing the word to use for it. And by actually reading and listening what they're saying, we find out what they mean. The map is not the territory. The word partial application is not the concept partial application. People can uh, intuit 
partial application as being something useful without actually knowing exactly what it is. This is not a pipe. <laughs> Sorry, it had to come back into this this talk. Uh, yeah, so bringing us back to partial application, um, we had been told that we can't do this because it'll be hard for programmers. It's called the garden path problem. If you want to know about it, uh, uh, come to me and I'll tell you what the garden path problem was and why we discarded partial application. But the thing is, this problem that was raised, we can test that. So we started with one problem. Then we had two problems, <laughs> then we had three problems, then we had another problem that we're going to focus on, and the original one's not entirely answered, but that's science, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much. Say no to it. <laughs> Here, you can you can all look at the new Spider Monkey logo. That's not the official Spider Monkey logo. Maybe it might come on eventually. So it's not an official policy of the DC 39 to um, do this kind of stuff. We're in the uh, so I'm in the process of having it adopted as official po policy. Uh, to say we first have to see if it works. Like we can't just introduce the policy without uh, without knowing that it's actually giving us a benefit. Uh, the, re the analysis of these two experiments actually took me a very long time and we can't spend that much time so we need, we need to iterate on the process, we need to make it better. We have had an okay from the TC39 to continue this work. As for Mozilla directly supporting it, they support me in doing my TC39 work and I'm pretty much allowed to choose what I consider to be important there. So I trust it in that sense. Google Chrome and Safari, do they do something similar? I'm making Chrome do this. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm also one of those language committees, but one that's not backed by companies. Is this feasible to do with just volunteers? Where do you get the people from? How much work is it? So um, first thing that I would recommend is work with a scientist. Uh, it is a lot of work, and they'll save you from shooting yourself in the foot, which I did uh, the first couple of times that I tried to do stuff. I did shoot myself in the foot. Um, and uh, this whole thing did take me three months to, first of all, run the experiment, do the initial analysis, discover that my data needed more work, uh, restart the whole process, and then reading a thousand comments takes a very long time. So depending on what kind of analysis you need to do, you may need to take different techniques and may take longer, so you want to be strategic about what you do research. And where do you get the people from to, to run these tests with? Uh, so, excellent question. <clears throat> the best way to do this is to pay people because then you end up with um, a known population that you're working with. But this isn't always possible. Uh, another way to do it is to do an open survey, which is the format that I did. And I didn't uh, control for gender because controlling for gender would mean that we would have to get data that's potentially sensitive in certain countries. And if that data gets leaked, those people could be in danger. So we didn't get that data. Uh, because I couldn't get it through legal in time. And uh, then from there, we just got like a broad scope of uh, participants. We had over 3,000 participants, so we could actually uh, normalize uh, the groups. And we focused on uh, different categorizations of beginners, intermediates, and experts, and took a look at how they responded to questions. But it's all volunteers who just... It's all volunteers. So yeah. you only get people who care and engage, but those who have to... Like which steal the JavaScript yeah. because they don't have to, they don't want to, and they get because they pay for it, and it's a pain. And yeah, exactly, and th that means that we're skewed towards uh, American white males uh, at about no between 82 and 93 percent. So we're not getting a general population. Okay. No. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I really like the format, by the way. Uh, it's very different from what we see normally. Um, so I'm coming from a sort of a science background, mm -hmm. and normally before you even start uh, that huge quantitative approach you, you did, you would do um, uh, more uh, like interview sessions or standardized mm -hmm. interview sessions to really avoid getting into the situation to do that qualitative analysis after you did the, the survey. I'm, so, yeah, I'm very glad that you bring this up. 
Uh, so I'm new to this. I don't come from a social sciences background, and I did the interviews beforehand. Uh, I didn't. I didn't mention it because I sort of jumped ahead. There was a lot to cover, but I did them ahead of time, and I asked people like, "What do you think?" and like went through a series of interview things. And I thought that I had the uh, questions ready, but it was only after the fact that I discovered like, "Wait, we're not really we're not really getting a, a result that I trust." I could I could have actually just been like, "Okay, I did the interviews. I got this result. Basically, the two proposals are equivalent," but um, I wouldn't have gotten this. Um, uh, unrestricted feedback from that last question and that's why I think that last question is so important because when you're in person interviewing something that that also modifies the situation because they saw me as an expert that's also maybe part of the problem and they didn't want to say something off and they just focused on these two versions they didn't give me generalized feedback so that was an interesting thing like I had done the interviews they were all like yeah I like it better and that was it and did, yeah. did our performance were you aren't uh, that much involved into the interview situation, more mm -hmm. like uh, for uh, observing, the, or observing the behavior, for yep. instance, did the, or the user experience uh, research has lots of these mm -hmm. methods available. Yeah, uh, to get, um, I use the word interview, but what happened is I actually watched them do the survey, oh. uh, and then we had a feedback session that we discussed it afterwards. So, but we can definitely talk about this more because the, the experiment wasn't perfect, but that's also what's interesting about it. I think we need to. Uh, we see. Yeah. Okay, thank you.